No. Welcome. Welcome to the sixth Fido's. I'm happy to see so many people this morning. And that's of course because we have a very uh, well-known speaker, Simon Fitz. And I'm, uh, it's still only for me as you hear, because I'm struggling with words. Uh, I'm going to thank all the, all the sponsors you see there on the screens, which made it possible to organize this event. And uh, I want to ask you, give them a big applause. <laughs> this year we have again a very good uh, time with some speaker strengths, and I hope you all enjoy this year's Tino's. So welcome, Mr. Simon Fitz, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll have that. Thank you. Um, so just to get you in the mood, I'm going to show you a video. All right, let's bring it here. And I'll explain why I'm showing you the video afterwards. There we go.
Thank you. Eric Whitaker's virtual choir. Uh, Eric is a, a, an American composer. Uh, there's a backstory to this piece of music as well, by the way. He composed this piece of music as a commission, setting one of Robert Frost's poems to music. And he received a cease and desist letter from the Robert Frost estate, telling him he, that he couldn't, even though Robert Frost was dead and even though 20 other people had done the same thing, he couldn't. And so uh, he decided he wouldn't lose the music and he commissioned a new poem that used the same meter, rhythm, rhyme, and in all the key places in the music, the same words, so that he wouldn't lose this piece of music. Um, what he did was he uploaded a video of himself conducting it onto the internet, and he released the score to the music, and he invited people to record themselves singing one of the eight parts. They uploaded those to YouTube, and this video is the result of over 2,000 people's individual YouTube videos from something like 58 countries uh, pieced together to produce a single piece of choral music. This is the meshed society. This is what happens when you uh, get the citizens of the world together to do things. The internet and peer-to-peer -peer isn't all about stealing stuff. It's also about creating stuff. And so I like to show this video wherever I possibly can, and I encourage you to show it particularly to your legislators, who probably, like the legislators in my country, need to discover that all that stuff they're being told by the music industry has another dimension that they need to understand. So what I'd like to talk to you about this morning is about open source and the meshed society. And I showed you that video because I wanted you to see a little bit of what I mean by the meshed society. The Mesh Society is a society where everybody is connected to everybody else, where there's no need for a mediator, where control points are damaged that the network roots around. That is the Mesh Society. Now, I was in, in Paris the other week for um, uh, the LibreOffice conference, and uh, I'm very sad I didn't see very many of you there. I only saw Core there, I think. Um, and while I was there, I saw... Um, the, I was in the, in the Place de la Bastille, and uh, the Place de la Bastille, you'll remember, is the place where uh, various French revolutions happened. Um, famously, the Bastille prison was there and was pulled down by one revolution. But there was another revolution in 1830, three glorious days in July, where the people of Paris decided that they were sick of um, rich bankers and unelected individuals setting the framework for their society. And so they picked up pitchforks and guns and went and turned them out. It was kind of the, the, uh, the 19th century's Occupy Paris. And this statue was erected to commemorate uh, those three glorious days, Occupy Paris. And um, it's a great statue. Uh, unusually for Paris, it's a naked man. Um, uh, and I was struck by this, by the fact that there are surveillance cameras on it that this memorial to the revolution, to liberating the people from unjust rule, has itself been used as a platform for uh, today's surveillance society. Now, this is an artifact of an effect that's been going on for centuries. Um, society started out, this is uh, the, the forum in Rome, society uh, started out as very small groups of collaborating individuals, and even in the Roman times, Society was small, local groups of people who were meshed together, mutually in, uh, interdependent, relying on each other through trade and through mutual support, uh, focused around collaborating and making a living. And that pattern of small meshes on a local level continued for centuries. Uh, it continued through the Moorish invasion of southern Europe, at the beginning, or around about the, f the 4th century to the 10th century. Uh, it was something that happened in the early tribes elsewhere in the United States. This is the, in Mesa Verde. The Mesa Verde Indians also had a, a village culture that relied on trade. That trade gradually adapted and uh, became a very highly sophisticated society where local communities would collaborate with each other. Now, one of the things that these collaborative societies produced was um, 
the idea of a craftsman. And in the early years, if you were a, a rich castle owner, you would have some artisans who worked for you. They built walls, they made bread, they cleaned the place. Uh, you'd keep the really good ones um, uh, on your estate. Uh, some of the less good ones you would allow to live somewhere nearby. Uh, the most dangerous ones you might keep chained up in the dungeon until you needed them. But generally speaking, the, the landowner was in control of what was going on. And these craftspeople gradually began to develop skills that they shared with one another. And out of that came the idea of trades, the idea of artisan craftspeople who would share know-how together, and they would form guilds of knowledge. In those guilds, people would share knowledge with each other. And uh, what would happen is that a, a master craftsperson would take in an apprentice, the apprentice would learn the craft, the apprentice would become part of a community of craft, and that apprentice would uh, then, once they had become a master themselves, typically set up shop nearby. And so in most European cities, you'll find streets called things like Bread Lane. And that was the place where the master bakers would all have set up shop next door to each other. And that reason was because, well, they were all related in work terms. One had been the apprentice of another and had set up shop nearby. And so a whole district would become focused on a particular trade. Uh, as time went by, those crafts and trades became very powerful, and an effect uh, that I'll refer to a couple of times began to take hold, an effect where um, when you create any system of rules, eventually a game springs up that plays the system and produces results that you weren't intending. Um, so now that carried on up until the middle of the 19th century when the Industrial Revolution came along and disrupted things. The Industrial Revolution was very disruptive because it, it broke up these local meshes and it introduced two important new concepts. One was a means of communication. So in most countries, communication was established either uh, initially by canals and then using railways and then quickly uh, along the same uh, time, time period through the telegraph. And the second invention was the factory. Instead of needing to have a, a, an artisan, a craftsperson, you could have unskilled workers who were repeating a pattern that a craftsman had, in, had created mechanically and um, mass producing goods. These two innovations of the factory and the rapid communication disrupted society. They broke the mesh and they introduced a new topology for society. Society was now no longer a mesh. It was now a, oops, wrong slide. It was now uh, a hub and spoke society. It was a society where the means of production were at the center and the consumers were at the edge. And between them was a channel which was a control point. In this era, small numbers of people became very rich indeed by controlling those channels to market, by controlling those means of communication and means of delivery and also the means of production. And we saw a society that began to base itself around this model, a hub and spoke model, where at the center would be a, a, a rich, controlling individual um, making the most of their environment. I hope there are no arachnophobes here. This guy, by the way, is a great spider. If ever you're in Australia, watch out for these guys. They're, they are about that across. It's a golden orb spider. This is uh, from underneath. They have uh, golden knees and they're black. They're not the deadliest spider that you'll find in Australia, though. The, the really bad, nasty ones are much smaller than this and sit in the toilet. <laughs> so, during the Industrial Revolution, we saw a hub-and-spoke topology spring up. And the whole of society began to revolve around this hub-and-spoke topology. It began to assume that the only way to do business was to have a control point over a product and take it to market. It began to assume that the only way to govern a country was to have small numbers of people empowered centrally because communication allowed central control. We saw this approach to society begin to uh, spring up and control everything we did. And we saw, uh, in particular, laws created that regulated that hub-and-spoke topology. 
Uh, laws like copyright law, like patent law, like trademark law. We saw the introduction of the idea of technical standards. All of these sprang out of a hub and spoke topology. Because the truth about any market is it needs regulating. Whether the market is a marketplace where there are people selling farm goods, or whether the market is a, uh, an international trading house for uh, derivatives of financial products, whatever the market is, it needs regulating. You have to have a few boundaries, a few rules. And so for the hub and spoke topology that arose from the Industrial Revolution, we saw these regulations come in. Now, um, one of the problems that I'll be alluding to throughout the talk is the problem of carrying these thoughts across into a meshed society. Because you see, we're no longer in a hub and spoke topology society. We're now in a society that is different from what came before the Industrial Revolution, <coughs> because the mesh has become a global mesh. The mesh has become a mesh on a global scale. It's no longer something happening locally between local individuals. It's now something that's happening between like-minded individuals wherever they are on the planet. The mesh society is the sort of society where Eric Whitaker's virtual choir can happen, where 2,000 choir geeks from 58 countries can come together to produce a single choral work. That's something that happens in a meshed society. That doesn't happen in a hub-and-spoke society. In a hub-and-spoke society, a music company brings a choir together in a concert hall and records it. But in a meshed society, a composer asks on the network if anyone is interested in joining in, and 2,000 people raise their hand and say, me. By the way, if you are a choir geek, Eric is about to launch Virtual Choir 3, and uh, he hopes that this time it will be a much bigger endeavor. His first exercise had around about 150 singers. The second one had about 2,000. So following the scaling that's going on there, we need about 20,000 on the next one. And I want to show that video uh, in a, somewhere like WIPO, uh, just after the RIA have been explaining how the internet is destroying creativity and taking money away from uh, artists. So in this meshed society that we're in, all the rules change. Now, uh, it's interesting to, to think about this because um, it produced, there are two consequences of the shift over from a hub-and-spoke society back to a globally meshed society. One of them is um, conflict. Um, the first time I had an inkling that this was going to happen was something very unusual happened in Copenhagen in about 2008. And that was a whole load of geeks, about a thousand of them, got together to have a street protest about an ISO standard. This is a whole bunch of people protesting outside the ISO standardization meeting about Microsoft OOXML being standardized. And this is, this is one of the amazing things that happens at this boundary between the hub and spoke society and the mesh society is the most unlikely people are motivated to protest. If you go visit some of the folks who are doing the Occupy protests in various places around the world, they are not your normal skinhead anarchists. Many of them are people who are just sick of having a degree in astrophysics and no job for five years, or seeing that they are, their taxes are being spent to pay bank bonuses in international centers. They're people who are uh, motivated by actually things that require quite a lot of thought. And so one of the things that will characterize this boundary between the hub and spoke society and the mesh society is protest. The other is um, disintermediation. So um, I, I quite like this photograph. I took this in Paris. Um, this is actually taken around midday. And you see that uh, this street lamp is lit by the sun. And there are many businesses that happen to be in just the right place at just the right time to make people think that they were essential to the supply of certain goods. But it turns out that in the meshed society, you can view the world a different way. And you can begin to get your goods a different way. And you can begin to do new and creative things with those goods, things that are even more beautiful and more inventive than the company that was originally controlling the market thought. And we're seeing people who've got old rules 
trying to impose their old rules on a new society. Now, I hear people saying that open source is good so far as it goes, but you've got to make money. As if the two things were orthogonal. As if they were unrelated in some way. Now, this may sound really obvious, but there is only one business model. Okay, There's only one business model. That business model is to satisfy your customer's scarcity from your abundance. That's the only business model there is. Every business model on the planet is this one, nuanced in some way. Um, what's happened as we've gone from a hub-and-spoke society to a mesh society is those control points have gone away, and so the impression of scarcity that people gained from the fixed topology of the hub-and-spoke society has gone away. And people are beginning to discover that control is no longer the way that you do business. And so that is where open source comes in. Open source, let's just briefly blow some dust away from open source. Because one of the things that happens at a technical conference is we forget why open source happened. All the rest of your sessions for the next two days are going to assume everyone understands open source. No one is going to bother to explain it at any point. So let me explain just briefly what open source is all about. Open source is what happens when some artisan, some craftsperson, creates some work of software and turns it into an open source commons. I don't know what this work of software does. Um, this artisan has created it. It's pretty good. She makes a living out of it. Does okay. She is a very enlightened artisan, and she has made her software available as a commons. And before long, some guy comes along, and he can see that there is an opportunity for him to do business with the same software. But to do business with the same software, he's just got to make a few changes to it. Maybe he's got to fix a few bugs. Maybe he's got to add a few features. Now, he could do this the old-fashioned way, by taking the code and working on it in private. That works for a lot of people. That's worked for IBM with open source for many years, taking code out of Apache and putting it into their products. But that's only smart so far as it goes. That speeds up your entry to the market, but it leaves you with a lifetime burden of maintaining the code that you write. Because you see, Every time she changes her code down here and puts it back into the commons, if he wants to benefit from it, he is going to have to refactor everything he wrote and re-implement it, probably. So he's, he's not stupid. So he takes his code and he puts it back in the commons. He's put it back in the commons not because he is a philanthropist, not because he is a radical socialist, probably because he is a capitalist. Probably he's put it back in there because he realizes that by contributing back to the commons, everybody else will look after his code and he'll be able to get on with doing business without the burden of a lifetime of refactoring and re-engineering the innovations that he's put in there. Contributing back to the commons liberates you to innovate. People who don't contribute to the commons probably are not innovators. They're probably maintainers. So open source is what happens when you get a network of people who, for various reasons, are collaborating around an, a source code commons, contributing back, innovating, and each being responsible for their own life. An open source project with a business model is not an open source project. I have a business model as a contributor. The project has a code commons. My business model pays my salary. The commons does not owe me a living. So this is open source. It is a collaborative space where many people synchronize a part of their own interests so that they can gain a greater benefit by collaborating together than they would gain by working alone. Now, in that network, anyone who tries to take control is going to have a problem. And so I used to work for Sun Microsystems, and I know all about corporations trying to control open source projects. I spent about five years trying to persuade people to let loose 
their grip on the control rods a little for a few projects. Not with a huge amount of success, I have to say. And when you try to control an open source project, at worst, nothing happens. And at best, the project will fork and carry on without you. But either way, control is a bad idea in a meshed activity. Because open source is just an attribute of the mesh society. See, open source had been carrying on before Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web and made everyone have the internet in their homes. Back then it was called free software. And free software was a hobby. It was an enthusiasm for, uh, for researchers. It was very attractive to people who had access to networks. But when the World Wide Web came along and made us all have the internet in our pocket, suddenly open source was be able to become a meshed phenomenon. It was able to become a phenomenon globally where people everywhere could collaborate with each other. And so today, if you want to work with open source, I recommend that you try to avoid control. Control will harm you. Control will make everybody else go somewhere else. It was a rigid desire for control of OpenOffice that made the real community take LibreOffice and create another project. It was a desire for control that made the Jenkins community go and create their community and fork away from Hudson. And each time there is an attempt at rigid control, if there's any life at all in the community, it will fork and go to some place where the community can be in control. If you want to succeed in an open source project, if you want to succeed in the meshed society, avoid control. Trade control for influence. Make friends. Go, real, go read Dale Carnegie. Make friends and influence people. Because the meshed society is a society of influence based on reputation, not a society, society of control and control points. Now, all of this is based on the idea of software freedom. That idea that existed before the World Wide Web, that it existed for something like 15 years before the World Wide Web came along. But it was the World Wide Web that put it into the hands of every man, that made us all able to participate. Um, uh, I tend to uh, talk about open source because I find that that concept resonates with most English-speaking people and people who are from the same language roots as English, that resonates better. Because in English, we're stuck with this idea of free not meaning liberty, but free instead meaning not paying. And that's the very worst thing you can think of in the case of free software. Because you see, payment is all about control, but liberty is all about influence. And focusing on liberty is the key to succeeding with open source. So I, I, I'd like to point out to you that actually open source is just the same thing as free software. Um, Richard Stallman, uh, many years ago, coined four freedoms that characterized uh, free software. Uh, this is written, by the way, at the European Parliament giving testimony. Um, you may have, I don't know what your view is of Richard, but Richard shows up in um, a lot of contexts having a lot of influence and uh, you should take him very seriously. Uh, he is a, he's influencing governments all over the world in a very deep and serious way. In particular, in South America, many governments down there take their IT policy pretty much directly for, from him. Uh, it doesn't happen so much in Europe. But anyway, this was in the European Parliament about five years ago. And uh, I looked at his four freedoms, and I think they're spot on. I think that the, the basis for open source is those four freedoms. But I've rephrased them a little to make them easier to explain and understand. The four freedoms are the freedom to use software for any purpose, the freedom to study the software and understand it, the freedom to modify the software and make it better suit your needs or the needs of others that you care about, and the freedom to distribute the software to whoever you wish. Those are the four freedoms around software. And the reason that those are important is because they are the basic dynamic of a meshed software society. I expect there to be analogues of these rules for any other domain of the meshed society, be it politics, be it music creation, be it video, be it
be it education, whatever it is, there will be analogues of those principles. Now, I, you may think that I'm sounding like some kind of a, a Che Stallman talking about this this way. And uh, indeed, I do have a beret down here. I've got my, my, my black gloves and, and I, I have my, my beret that I can put on. Uh, but actually, I'm, I'm a, a, a raging radical capitalist here because I think that the four freedoms are fundamental to doing business. That freedom to use software for any purpose is fundamental to you as a CIO having control of your destiny. It's time for you to fling off the shackles of arbitrary control from your software vendor telling you which processor you may run which thread on and how much you will have to pay for the privilege. For God's sake, who cares? What right has anybody got to tell you in your business what processor or how many processors you run software on? That's an artifact of a control society. There was a time when software was delivered down a channel where you could have that sort of control. But we don't live in that world anymore. No, the freedom to use the software for any purpose, running it wherever you wish, doing whatever you want with it, is fundamental to today's IT society. And more and more CIOs are realizing that they don't want to have these artificial controls over what they do with their software. And the reason this is really important in today's society is when you have the freedom to use software for any purpose, you have control over your budget. If you are using proprietary software that wants to control how many threads you are running on how many cores of how many processors, then you're going to find that as your business adapts, you're going to have to pay money to change. And you're also going to find that your software vendor will have you locked in so tightly that when they come round for their annual, annual review, that annual review is them saying to you, here's how much you're going to pay for your software this year. And the answer is, take it or leave it. And by the way, if you leave it, the bill for leaving is going to be this much. So the freedom to use software for any purpose is fundamental to today's CIO. So is the freedom to study the software. Not because the CIO wants to study the software, but because they want to participate in a free market for skills. They want to be able to get the geeks that can do the stuff. And that market has previously been under the control of proprietary vendors who, uh, for example, want to make sure that their certified staff obey licensing rules. They want to make sure their certified staff only use the techniques that apply to the product roadmap that the uh, vendor has got. But in a, an open source society, that freedom to study leads to things like LPI. It leads to people like you, who have got skills that you gained not because somebody decided to force feed you with them, but because you could acquire them yourself, because you were free to study. I would wager that many of you learnt key skills for your job by running software at home, because you could. And that has become the key skill generation path for many people in today's IT society. That freedom to modify the software. No CIO in his right mind wants to modify the operating system, honestly. If you know a CIO who thinks that modifying the operating system is a great idea, then you work for Google. Apart from them, don't know anyone else who would think that it was even vaguely smart to modify the operating system. But being free to modify the operating system creates the Linux market. Being free to modify the operating system prevents control freaks controlling the software in the market. Being able to modify the software allows you to fork. And the freedom to fork gives you the freedom to work around control points. The freedom to fork allows you to create dynamic new variants. The freedom to modify the software lets you innovate and then contribute back to the community. The freedom to modify is fundamental to the value that comes out of open source software for today's CIO. And then finally, the freedom to distribute the software. It allows you to create an ecosystem. It allows you to empower citizens. It allows you to share software with your partners and with your customers. It allows you to let your employees work from home. Oh yes, had you ever considered whether your software license for your proprietary software allows you to work from home? Have you read that end user license agreement? No? I suggest you do. You might discover that running LibreOffice is quite a good idea after all. So I'd suggest to you 
that the reason the four freedoms are important is not because we all should be radical, evangelical, socialist, atheist, software geeks, but rather because those four freedoms are fundamental to doing business in a mesh society. And without them, you will be condemned to being part of the hub-and-spoke economy, and being part of that economy is a recipe for failure. That hub-and-spoke economy is going away. If that's your world, I suggest that you uh, retire soon. So software business value, in every case that I've seen in today's society, is the first derivative of software freedom. So I'm going to suggest to you something really radical here. Now, I know that when we're hiring staff, it's not uncommon in the advertisement for staff to say that we would like to have, for example, um, agile development skills. Now, we all know that agile development skills is actually a, a, a keyword. It tokenizes a whole raft of things that we share in common, that are common knowledge. So I can say that I want agile development skills, but I know that what I'm going to get is a whole set of behaviors, practices, and experiences that are going to be beneficial to my development shop. I'm going to suggest to you that you also specify software freedom. Because software freedom is a, a phrase that tokenizes all of these business values. The liberty to use software in your business interests rather than in your supplier's interest. The liberty to hire staff who are trained by themselves and by the market rather than by the vendor. The liberty to participate in a market that's not under the control of a single iron hand the liberty to give the software to any part of the ecosystem that needs it. I suggest you specify software freedom, because by specifying software freedom, you begin to promote these values that you know you need, but at the moment you, you, you're forced to try and describe individually. Well, begin to use that phrase, software freedom. I suggest you use that phrase, rather than free software or open source. Uh, the reason that I suggest you don't use the phrase free software is because lots of people who speak English will think that you are uh, a cheapskate. And I the reason I suggest you don't use the phrase open source is because despite our very best efforts at the OSI, people who are doing things like cloud computing and open core computing have been able to bastardize the expression and make people think that open source is something to do with control. So specify software freedom. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that there are more values than I've described to you that come from software freedom, that if we hadn't kind of screwed up and used the word free in English, we would actually pay extra for open source. Here's four reasons why. First of all, there's no license compliance management. Secondly, community escrow protects your investment. Thirdly, you can build simple ecosystems. And fourthly, you can do adoption-led development. First of all, license compliance. Now, you know that when you buy proprietary software, it comes under the terms of an end-user license agreement. Have you ever read those end-user license agreements? Many of you shook your heads a little bit earlier. Well worth doing. Uh, the end-user license agreement for the Apple iTunes Music Store now runs to, I believe, 48 pages. And in those 48 pages, you can be sure that around about page 27, there is a clause telling you that in case of breach, they're entitled to come and take away your firstborn. And I'm sure that already, all over the world, there is the knock at the door as the Apple representative comes to take away your son or your daughter. Uh, you may be pleased about that if they've reached teenage. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason for the popularity of iTunes amongst teenagers. I don't know. But end-user license agreements are a big problem. Because end-user license agreements mean that you agree to terms that are managed on a per-user basis. And as a consequence of that, most businesses treat software asset management as a major cost of doing business. The reason they do this is because if you don't treat software asset management as a major cost of doing business, then I, I don't know whether here in the Netherlands you have the Business Software Alliance, uh, but the Business Software Alliance is a, is a global plague. Uh, and um, I've got a, a good friend over in uh, the west coast of the US who runs a business that makes guitar strings. And uh, one morning, uh, there was a knock on the door. I think it was actually a Saturday morning. There was a knock on the factory door. He was in early. It was about 6 a.m. Outside, there was a bunch of federal marshals, all armed. Uh, and they had come to do what I believe is colloquially termed an involuntary audit. 
Uh, this is where the Business Software Alliance, having been tipped off, typically on their Shop Your Boss hotline, yes, that really exists, uh, drop around to check that all the copies of proprietary software you have are under valid licenses. Um, now, what had happened to at Ernie Ball Music, which was the company, was that they had recently upgraded all their PCs. And they got new ones, and they'd installed all their software on these new PCs, but they hadn't removed the software from the old ones that were all stacked up around the edge of the room. And so consequently, they were technically in breach of one of the terms of the end user license agreement. And uh, the Business Software Alliance and Microsoft issued a press release explaining how they were guilty of piracy, uh, got them to pay a, I think it was a six figure sum of money, and uh, generally didn't do their business a lot of good. So Ernie Ball Music decided that they would never again buy proprietary software, and that was when they switched over to using Linux and OpenOffice. Uh, many years ago. If you want to escape from doing that sort of uh, license compliance work, then what you have to do is switch to open source. Because you see, open source software doesn't have an end user license agreement. I hate it, by the way, when I have to click through the open source license when I'm starting to run a piece of open source software. If you write open source software, don't do that. Because the end user license agreement for open source software is you're free to use the software for any purpose, full stop. End users have no additional restrictions on their use of open source software. It's only when you distribute the software that you're subject to any terms that need any kind of compliance management. And even then, that's only the case with uh, GPL licensed software or other copyleft licensed software. Open source software is free to use for any purpose. So you can use it in your business without having to do software asset management, without having the opportunity for the BSA to come and audit you at six o'clock in the morning with armed federal marshals. This is a great benefit. This is worth paying extra for. The amount of money that your employer is paying for software asset management in your business is probably enough to hire extra staff. If you didn't have to do all of that license tracking, counting how many threads were running on how many processors and how many hours of the day, you could probably spend that money on doing better business. It's worth paying extra to get open source software that doesn't make you do that. Yeah. Second thought for you is community escrow. What happens if your vendor goes away? Now, one of the things that's kind of fun when I'm out uh, working for Forgerock, who I work for now, is I hear folk telling me that they don't want to buy open source software because they prefer the security of having a vendor behind them. Okay? Now I find that very amusing because uh, in, in the case of Forgerock, where I am now, uh, we found that there was a load of software that was abandoned by a big proprietary vendor and it was it being open source that protected the customers from the consequences because we were able to start our business to simply pick the software up, re-host it, and carry on as if nothing had happened. If you're using proprietary software and your proprietary vendor changes strategy, or more likely is acquired, your only option is to start again. If you're using open source software and your vendor goes away or is acquired, somebody in your community can simply carry on. I call this community escrow. It's like the escrow of the old days where the source code was put in a safe and delivered to you on the expiry of your vendor. But it's much more useful because I, I don't know what you would do with 10 million lines of PL1 source code out of a, a, a lawyer's safe. I would be pretty confused by it myself. But an open source community can simply start new businesses to deliver new support. Simple ecosystems. The best way to get interoperability is if you all run the same software. Now, I, you know, I'm a big fan of open standards, but honestly, the best way to get interoperability is if you all run the same software. The proprietary vendors know this, and that's what their business model depends on. Well, let's one-up them, shall we? The best way to get interoperability is to all run the same open source software. You can do that, and it is actually something that will cost you less but will deliver you more, more value. You can give the open source software to anyone. You can give it to your partners, give it to your customers. You can, uh, if you're a government, you can give it to your citizens. And there's no license management that you have to do. Finally, adoption-led deployment. Adoption-led deployment is where you prototype and iterate. 
where you're free to start using the software and then if it works out you're able to proceed and buy support. If it doesn't work out you failed early and the only money you spent was on the prototype. Compare this to most proprietary procurement processes where at great cost you write a specification and then your vendor uses every piece of politics they can think of to persuade your boss to pick the wrong option to implement the spec. And then the spec is implemented using software that has been expensively acquired. And then when it fails, your boss won't cancel the project because he's spent too much money and reputation getting you to the point where you are. That's the proprietary procurement process. The open source procurement process, you, you, you start it, you see if it'll work, and if it will, then you implement it, and then you buy a support contract. I don't know which one you would prefer. Certainly my customers prefer the second one. So these are all extra value options, premium values. I would suggest to you that if we didn't know better, if no one had told us that open source was supposed to be free, we would pay extra for open source software because it comes with the liberty left in. You know, you've seen those children's toys at Christmas that say battery is not included on the side of the box. Well, your proprietary software comes with that on the edge of the box. It says liberty not included. You have to go and get the liberty from somewhere else. But with open source, the liberty is included. The liberty is in the box. You are free to use the software for any purpose, to study it, to modify it, to participate in a market that benefits from those values. You are uh, free to do as you wish. Uh, I took this photograph in Battery Park in New York and you see there, there is the Statue of Liberty, that great symbol of liberty and in the background there are the dock cranes of New Jersey adopting the same posture and hoping you'll think they're about liberty as well. <clears throat> and this I would suggest to you is what the software market is doing today. It is wanting you to believe that it is all about liberty when actually it's all about commerce. And I believe that we have to focus on liberty. Now that then raises some questions. I do keep on having people ask me, well, you know, how are you going to make money if you're going to give away all your software all the time? Um, well, I would uh, first of all remind you that uh, there is only one business model. And that business model is to satisfy your customer's scarcity from your abundance. And I would remind you that in today's society, artificial scarcity is considered to be something you work around. So I would suggest that if you're going to create some kind of a business, you don't try and create it with artificial scarcity involved. Is it possible to create a business model around software that is profitable, but nonetheless leaves customers with their freedoms intact? Well, I believe that it is entirely possible to do that. There are a number of freedom-respecting business models. Uh, there are things like uh, consulting services and turnkey development. Things like building distributions and distributing them, like Red Hat does. Uh, things like support-only models on free software. But I think it's come time to grow up a little, to go beyond just those uh, models that assume that fully-fledged products exist somewhere else that you're going to then deliver support on. I believe that if we're going to make a success of open source, we need to begin to see uh, ISVs, open source ISVs. People who take responsibility for building free software, but nonetheless profit from its existence. So that was the reason why um, last year um, a group of us started this company called Fordrock. Um, which is one of the companies, uh, one of this conference's sponsors, where I work. Um, we were founded in 2010 in a bunch of countries with a bunch of people, self-funded. We were based around a whole lot of software that had been abandoned by Oracle when they acquired Sun Microsystems. Uh, most of the identity software that Sun made was surplus to requirements at Oracle, and so Oracle quietly and politely walked away from it and left it uh, to wither in the field. And we didn't think that was a r the right thing to do, so we decided that we would be that open source ISV. Um, we would be the company 
that uh, created open source software with nothing proprietary, with no copyright assignments, uh, no copyright aggregation, with communities that were uh, open to any party to participate in. Our products would be subscription products, as I'll explain in a moment, and that we would make money from selling uh, lifecycle tuned subscriptions. By subscription, what I mean is that you're selling a service level agreement to make your customers' implementation succeed. You're selling sustaining, that's the promise that you will keep your customers' software working even as the environment changes around it. And finally, that you will engage in research and development, producing new versions of the software so that uh, the software can continue to work in, um, the, in emerging markets. So we did that. We created uh, a platform that had OpenAM in it. That's access management software. Uh, OpenDJ, that's an LDAP server. OpenIDM, that's a provisioning server. Uh, the first two were derived from former Sun products. The top one was OpenSSO. The second one was OpenDS. The third one we've written ourselves from scratch. Uh, it's all based on open source and open standards. Uh, it provides Sun customers with a place they can get that uh, uh, community escrow. And it provides developers who would like to do modern identity management on a high scale with an open source solution. And so that's what we're doing. So far, so good. We've got about 80 customers. We've got about 50, 50 staff. Um, we are, uh, so far, we haven't needed to get investment from outside. We're finding that the market is very keen indeed to do business with an open source ISV. And we're finding that our partners are very keen indeed to participate in that ecosystem. I believe that this model is a, an entirely viable model for doing business and is one of a range of grown up open source business models that we'll see coming as time goes by. It's a hard to repeat our experience Although, actually, you'd be surprised how many software products Oracle has abandoned over the, over the years. And you would be surprised by just what a profitable business you can have from taking them over and continuing development. But there are other ways to um, uh, have a, a freedom-respecting software business in the mesh society. The key is to focus on software freedom. There's no single pattern, but there are uh, some good examples. Um, one of them is CloudBees. CloudBees offers a software development environment in the cloud. That software development environment is all built from open source software. And the reason that you want to do business with them rather than put the software together yourself is because, well, they've done all the hard work of configuring it, of making sure that it runs, making sure that it's manageable, making sure that it's sustainable. And so it's more economical for you to do business with them than for you to put all the same parts together yourself. And they then continue to contribute to all the communities they participate in, like the Jenkins community. And, well, everyone's happy. Or um, look at what StatusNet are doing. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with StatusNet. StatusNet is a, an open source um, microblogging platform, kind of like Twitter. But it's uh, being created flexibly with many different options for microblogging left open for people to implement. Most importantly, it's federated. So you can run your own copy in your own premises, and that copy of the software that you're using to have all of your staff able to collaborate with each other is able to federate with uh, StatusNet's own instance called Identica and federate messages out and federate messages in. Um, very interesting model. This is the same sort of model that Diaspora is using as well, of having federatable software that is run in the cloud as a business. Uh, this is one use for the cloud that I think is uh, extremely good for the future of software. So there's, there are many ways to build value from open. I believe that this is going to be what happens in the mesh software society. So to conclude for you, uh, I'd like to suggest to you that we are in the, uh, the leading wave of a social revolution that we're seeing a return to the mesh society of the Middle Ages and before the Industrial Revolution. Only this time, the mesh society is not on a village scale, it's on a global scale. It's able to produce global effects like Eric Whitaker's virtual choir or like the LibreOffice community. Things that involve people from many, many, many countries 
who locally are so dilute that they can have no impact, but globally are able to produce something wonderful. That is the meshed society. And I believe that that meshed society is going to dominate politics. It's going to dominate commerce. It's going to dominate culture. It is going to dominate society. I'd suggest to you that the key to your part of the world is uh, by, to not get trapped in the word free. Ignore gratis. Ignore the trap that the English-speaking world has set for you. And instead of focusing on price, focus on freedom. In focusing on freedom, make sure that you focus on influence rather than control. And in the final analysis, focus on software freedom. Software freedom is the key. Software freedom is the lubricant that makes the mesh society work in software. It, you'll see the same effect in politics, in culture, in every other mesh society. But focus on software freedom. Always ask who has it. In an open core model, the people who have it are the vendor. They don't give it to you, they use it. <coughs> Always check who has got the software freedom and make sure that it's you. Specify that you want it. Ask for software freedom in what you're doing. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'd be very pleased to take any questions or engage in a, a, a straight down brawling argument on the floor, if that's what you'd like. Thank you very much. So there's normally somebody who disagrees profoundly with something I've said. Okay, so what I, what I believe we'll see happening is what happened in the Middle Ages, which is we'll see trade guilds built, building up. So um, I think we'll see things like the Eclipse Foundation springing up that provide a place where all of the different companies who are and individuals that are trading around an open source project are able to come together in a framework that expresses the desire and will of that community strongly. Um, it's interesting actually thinking about what open source licenses mean uh, in that environment. Um, we often think that a, an open source license describes uh, a business relationship, a peer-to-peer -peer business relationship. And that's what, it, that's what a contract does when you own a lawyer creates a contract for you. A contract is like a, a mutual declaration of war. It, contracts list all the things that can go wrong and what you're going to do if they do go wrong. And there, there is an encouragement to not go wrong. Well, open source licenses, according to Eben Moglen, who I think is one of the finest minds of open source and free software thinking, he, he believes that a license is the constitution for a community, that the software license sets the ethos for the community. And I believe that the future of, uh, of free software is to have open source foundations of one kind or another acting as the, uh, the steward of the software for the community and keeping peace between the community participants. Um, now, we've got to watch this because if, you, if, you, if you've studied trade guilds at all, you'll know that things didn't go entirely smoothly for trade guilds. You'll discover that trade guilds became a major source of corruption and political intrigue in society. Um, m most people were quite pleased when the guilds were no longer in control and, and people like Henry Ford were. Um, so we have to watch that because whenever you create any system, you create the game that plays it. But having said that, that's what I think the future looks like. I think it's um, f open source foundations. I think it's relatively small businesses. I think the opportunity for really big business goes away in a mesh society uh, because a really big business depends on having a centralized uh, pool of wealth and control points through which they're able to monetize it. I think in a mesh society, you see m lots of smaller businesses, either operating by aggregating val um, customers from across the globe on a, on a very specialized basis, or by acting locally and aggregating customers on a local basis. 
Um, there is a lot to be said about that subject, though, because I, I think that um, if we're going to learn from history and not completely screw things up, we do need to think about what a good foundation looks like, um, what good governance looks like. So one of the things that I've been thinking about on that subject is um, creating a, a benchmark for um, what, an open, what good open source looks like. So I, I created this open by rule benchmark. Um, but uh, that's the subject of another talk. Uh, quest there was a question at the front, and then there's a question at the back. There isn't a question at the front, so I'll come to the back. So I like the walk, don't worry. Um, the one thing that I still find uh, lacking in all of uh, open source uh, freeware, uh, anything, is uh, a substitute for what we have now in the form of advertising. Mm -hmm. If I make a product, how the hell am I going to tell the world that it exists? Do you have any thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, I, so, when it comes to software, I, I actually think that's uh, much less of a problem than it used to be. Uh, I think that people are getting used to going and looking at the market for software uh, and discovering what exists out there. Uh, it is a problem when it comes to consumer software. So despite the fact that LibreOffice is a year old, there are still lots of people who have never heard that OpenOffice is now called LibreOffice. And I don't know how we advertise that. Core's doing a, you're doing a lousy job, Core. Why haven't you advertised LibreOffice better? <laughs> so, so, I mean, I hope you're all using this presentation is <laughs> This presentation is all done with LibreOffice. And if you're interested in LibreOffice, Core is coming up the session, not the next session, but the session after that. Go listen to him. Um, but I, I think that we do have a big problem when it comes to consumer software. Uh, when it comes to business software, I don't actually think there's too much of a problem because I think that most of you, our staff know what's out there. You know, I, I'm ne I never cease to be amazed that the people that I've hired have got such a broad understanding of the software market. And it's because they've been, uh, they, you know, they're on Slashdot, they're on... Uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, y Combinator and, the, and the, the different sites, they're seeing all the software flying past. And I say, well, you know, is there an open source message queuing product? Oh, yes, there are. There's, there's three, yes. So that they know that. But when it comes to consumer software, I think it's much more of a problem. I think that problem's going to go away because I think the desktop software is, is not going to be around for very much longer. Uh, I think we're going to have uh, internet-based software that has um, uh, desktop clients and I think people will rapidly work out which desktop client they want to use because it will be advertised in the web-based software. Um, I, I think that's a world we need to um, treasure and fear. We need to treasure it because it's exactly the way that you want software to work. We need to fear it because your software freedom could very well be scared away by it. Okay, we can have one more question, I'm told. <laughs> I'm told that, and, and so what is your question? Okay. Okay, well, there's no question there. There's no time for more, more questions. We have to carry on. If there are more people want to have uh, questions or so things, I suggest you do it. Uh, I want to thank Simon for his <laughs>